Okay, I don't know where to start, but here I go. My name was Joshua. I used to live in the United States in a state I won't mention, with my sister and her son. My sister moved in with me after leaving her abusive husband. What I'm about to say happened about a year and a half ago, but I'm still suffering from nightmares. I was afraid to come out and speak the truth about this story. But after much convincing from a few close friends, I felt I could truly, truly trust. I decided to share this story as a warning. What I'm about to say is 100% true. This is what myself and my friend experienced. So it was back in June, a year and a half ago. I've been working at a group home in my state as a social worker for abused kids but then after a couple of months, myself and a few other employees there, one of them being a close friend of mine named Sam, well, we were all let go. I was devastated. I didn't even know how I'd make ends meet. And so I went out looking for jobs, putting in applications, going on interviews, and so did Sam. But nothing I was doing, or Sam was doing, turned out well. After the better part of six months, with myself and Sam still being unemployed, I know I personally began to get really frustrated. I had a mortgage to pay, I had other bills to pay, plus I was taking care of my sister and her kid, so it was safe to say that I needed a job, and quickly. So I went searching through Craigslist, and I found this one job. They were looking for live-in housekeepers a cook and a front desk clerk. The pay was 20 bucks an hour, and it came with free room and board, with us being able to go back to our own homes on the weekend. And I thought, hell, I can't beat this 20 bucks an hour? That's damn good money. It wasn't working in my career field, but at this point, I was willing to take what I could get. And so that evening, I called the number I saw on the Craigslist ad, and this guy with a southern accent answered. I told him I was interested in applying, and he asked when I could come in for an interview. I told him tomorrow, and he asked if I could come that very same evening. Huh? Come that evening? That was pretty fast for an interview. I thought, and I even told the guy this, not that I was complaining though, but I just thought it was odd, especially seeing as it was already 4 in the evening and close to getting dark when I had called. Anyway, the guy said that they were pretty desperate, and that if I really wanted the position, coming that evening would help them out. I agreed to come and asked if I could bring a friend. I was referring to Sam, and the guy said, yeah, sure, asked me what my name was, gave me the address of where to go and said that he'd see us when we got there. And so I told my sister and my nephew, he was 15 at the time, that I was going to do this job I found on Craigslist. And as I ignored my sister and my nephew's ranting about how I should be careful about what I respond to on Craigslist, I left the house, went to pick up Sam, and we went on our way to the job interview. As we were driving, I got annoyed listening to Sam's constant rantings about his $20 an hour job being too good to be true. I didn't care if it was too good to be true. I needed a job. I was desperate, so I was going to believe it was true, no matter what. I couldn't believe how far out it was from the main city, though. I mean, for the better part of an hour... The ride consisted of me driving down a long stretch of rural road, with nothing but woods on both sides. When Sam and I finally got there, though, the B&B &B was sitting back up off the road, and it looked like one of those plantation houses you see in Louisiana. When we walked up to the porch of the B&B, &B, we were greeted by some skinny, young-faced kid who couldn't have been any older than 20. His name was Trent. Now, Trent looked like someone who belonged at a skater park somewhere, and he gave us this weird smile upon greeting us. He told Sam and I that we were the fourth and fifth applicants that had been interviewed today, 
and that the other applicants who had all come had been hired on the spot for the positions that they wanted. And I thought, whoa, people being hired on the spot. That was rare. Hell, it took me three interviews before I was hired to be the counselor at the group home I was working at before. Anyway, as Trent walked us into the B&B and led us into the kitchen, he turned around to face us and said, You know, I think Jack will like you too. And as Sam began to speak, from out of nowhere behind us appeared this big, tall, built-ass guy. The guy was so tall, he looked like he could be a replacement for the wrestler, the undertaker. Now Sam and I found out the guy was Jack. He was the owner of the B&B. After Sam introduced ourselves to him, Sam, Jack, and I walked to a big ballroom area to sit and talk. I asked Jack who it was that I talked to on the phone earlier that evening when inquiring about the job, since I recognized that it wasn't his voice I had been talking to. Jack told me I'd been talking to his brother Charlie. Jack said that Charlie was the brains behind the whole operation. Operation? I asked. I mean, you mean behind the opening of the B&B? Jack responded with a yes, and a weird laugh before saying, Yeah, well, that's what I meant. Now Jack went on to tell us that Charlie would be around the B&B for a little while, but that mostly Charlie would be working behind the scenes, and that he, Jack, and his son, Trent, and his daughter, Marissa, would be the ones who would be running and operating the B&B from day to day, once it opened. He then told us that he, Trent, and Marissa worked for Charlie, and that Charlie was an affiliated worker for a top-secret entity within the government. <laughs> now, that piqued my curiosity, so I asked Jack what the entity was, but Jack wouldn't say. In fact, he changed the subject by suggesting we follow him into his office so he could interview us there. And of course we did. As we went into his office, the first thing that stood out to me was how fucking creepy it was. There were bottled animals of all types on shelves and tables around the room. Pigs, spiders, even shrunken heads. You name it, well... Jack old boy had it, and it looked like we had stepped into a scene from Rob Zombie's house of a thousand corpses. However, I didn't care too much of what he had in his office. All I wanted was a job. So as Sam and I sat at his desk, ready to be interviewed by Jack, and it was at this time that I noticed a very unique looking tattoo on Jack's lower arm. It was a black tattoo of an owl with a pyramid in the middle of the body of the owl, and in the middle of the period was an all-seeing eye. I asked Jack what the tattoo meant, and he said that he loved owls and that the tattoo was something he got during college. Now, before I could probe him any further, he quickly changed the subject by stating his hopes that he would hire two more people so he could finally begin work on getting the B&B ready for opening. And so after the interview began with Jack asking us weird questions, like how healthy we were, when was the last time we were sick, what was our eye color, were we on any prescription medicine, and even more weird than that, what was our blood types, and if we were both signed up as organ donors on our driver's licenses? Now, throughout all of these questions, Sam and I were like, what the hell do these questions have to do with the jobs we have to do here at the B&B? But Jack assured us, though, that the questions were 100% being legitimately asked, in case any emergencies happened to us while working at the B&B. Jack even told us some story of a guy who once worked for him, who was secretly on pain meds, and how one day, Jack found the guy dead in the concrete mixer. I still found all the questions beyond weird, though, and so did Sam. And to be honest, I felt like I was ready to just get up and get out of there and leave, 
because I was beginning to think that maybe this wasn't even a real interview, but some kind of damn scam or something. But the desperateness of me wanting a job kicked in again, and on top of that, Jack assured us with seriousness once again that the questions were being asked because he was all about safety in the workplace. So, I stayed for the rest of the interview. So did Sam. But the interview got even more weird. See, Jack told us that as soon as Charlie got my name and number from earlier when I called, he and Jack ran a full background check on me. I couldn't believe it. How could he run a background check on me with just my name and number? Sam and I thought this was just way beyond creepy, and Jack told us that he would be surprised what a person can find out with just a name and a telephone number. Once again, I was creeped out. What employer does this even before a potential employee comes for the job interview? At this point, I couldn't hold it in anymore. I had to ask him if this was even a real interview. And sure enough, he assured Sam and I that it was, and that he had to make sure he was getting the right type of employees. <laughs> yeah, right, I thought. I still found something creepy about the entire thing, but I didn't want to leave because, well, I knew I couldn't. I had so many bills. So at this point, Jack said the interview was over, and that we were both hired because he liked us. Yes. I thought, I finally got it. I finally got a damn job. Now, inside my mind, I was doing backflips. So then Jack showed us around the B&B and told us that before the place opened, we would have to pitch in and do a lot of cleaning to it. And indeed, he was right. With the exception of the four rooms in the B&B, every other room he showed us looked like a complete dump including one room having a body chalk outline on the floor. Jack explained, though, that the body chalk outline came from a murder that occurred when the former owners owned the house. Then he took us to what had been one of the creepiest rooms in the entire house. The walls of the room were covered in blood, with a gurney sitting on one side of the room, and a wheelchair sitting on the other side. Jack explained the look of the room as it was told by him by the previous owners of the house. A group of guys were staying at the house while attending a rodeo in town. One of the guys cut himself and smeared blood all over the walls. Jesus fucking Christ, I thought. That was creepy in and of itself, but Jack stating that to him. The room resembled a kill room. Well, oh, hell... That just made the entire situation even more scary in my mind, and it honestly sent chills down my spine. So after viewing the entire inside of the house, I'm thinking, that's it, we've seen the house, we've been hired, we can go home now and come back on Monday bright and early for work. But nope, because Jack then takes us out to the garage and says, well, I've got one more thing to show you, boys. The Wooded Nature Trail. Huh? The Wooded Nature Trail? At night? How the hell can he show us the Wooded Nature Trail when it's dark as shit outside? But he gives us each a flashlight before he takes one for himself, and then he grabs his shotgun off a shelf. Whoa, I thought, I hate guns. When I was eight, my dad and I were at a gas station one night. My dad was robbed at gunpoint and murdered. Ever since then, guns have scared the crap out of me. However, Jack assured Sam and I that he was taking the gun because of the dogs that often roam the woods at night. That explanation made me now not only not want to go out with someone toting a gun, but it also made me not even want to go out into the woods, period. However, seeing the look of annoyance on Jack's face, I decided to hide my fears and go along with the gun and the wooded nature trail. After all, 
I didn't want to lose the job I had just got hired onto. And so as we walked along this wooded nature trail, going deeper and deeper into the woods, Jack began to ask us what made us tick. What things did we enjoy? Sam, well, he said he enjoyed painting. I said I liked to do what I did as a counselor, helping people, empowering people. As Jack and I began to converse about my last job, after a few minutes, he hushed me as he said he heard climbing noises in the trees around him. Now I looked at Jack as if he were nuts. I mean, of course you heard climbing noises, you dumbass, you're in the woods. I thought. As Jack eyed a squirrel climbing up the tree, he told me to hold his flashlight while he pointed the shotgun at the squirrel. When Sam asked him what the hell he was doing, Jack said he was going to shoot the squirrel. What the hell? I thought. I asked Jack, why? And Jack just shot me the creepiest glare and said, huh, Boy, you're funny. As Jack was about to shoot the squirrel, he stopped looked at me and asked, Now, wait a minute, where are my goddamn manners? Do you want to shoot it? I was thinking this man is nuts. I'm not one who hurts animals, so I immediately declined. And as Jack asked Sam, Sam declined as well. But before Sam could get out another word besides the word no, Jack fired and shot the squirrel dead to the ground. Now the sound of the shotgun was so loud that it echoed in my ears like an explosion. As Jack laughed like a madman while trampling over and picking up the dead squirrel that had blood oozing out of it, and looking at it like it may have been a tasty lunch meal, I thought, this guy is pretty weird. But I thought I didn't care if he's weird or not. As long as we had the job, it's all that mattered. 100%. So after killing the squirrel and after Jack told us how he was going to add the squirrel to his collection of dead animals in his office, we proceeded to walk away from the wooded nature trail, back to the B&B, and back to my car, as finally the most weirdest job interview ever was appearing to be over. However, the strangeness didn't stop on our way back to my car though. As we were walking, Jack asked me to hold his dead bleeding squirrel because he claimed he couldn't hold his gun and the squirrel at the same time. He didn't ask Sam to hold it. He asked me to. I obviously didn't want to hold it. The thing looked disgusting as hell, dead and bloodied. But because I wanted to keep my current job status as hired, I reluctantly agreed to hold it while we walked back to the car. I held it by the end of its tail, my arm's length, and I tried to hold back my urge to vomit out of sickness for what was dangling in front of my eyes. As we walked back to my car, I was mentally thanking the gods that the interview was over. I mean, I was thrilled to finally have a job, but boy, was that one creepy interview. Anyway, as Jack told us to be back at the B&B bright and early Monday morning, 8am to be exact, I gave Jack back his dead and bloody squirrel, happily, and Sam and I got into my car and we drove away. So that weekend, I packed as much stuff as I thought I would need for the week at the B&B, and when Monday came, I hugged my sister and my nephew goodbye, and I headed for it. Sam drove to the B&B in his own car, and I met up with him that morning when I arrived at the B&B. It was at this time that I also met the two other employees. Katrina, I won't give her last name out of respect for her family, and Rob, again I won't give his last name. We also met Jack's daughter, Marissa, who looked like a cracked out 80 version of Ali Sheedy, but just with longer, shaggier hair. We also met Charlie. Charlie looked like one creepy guy with his dark brown slicked back hair, his cold black eyes. He was a bit short but built in the chest. His face looked hard and like he didn't take crap from anyone. Anyway, after Jack introduced all of us to each other, 
Jack informed us that there was no need for us to try to use our cell phones because we wouldn't get any cell phone service where we were, and that phone and internet service in the B&B hadn't been installed yet. So other than our cars, we had no other way to contact anyone in town. You would think that should have been a red flag in my mind, but it wasn't, because to me it made sense. The B&B was in a rural area, so of course our cell phones wouldn't work up there. After Jack explained all that, we went to work. Katrina began working in the kitchen, cleaning it and performing a cooking test for Trent. I worked on cleaning up the backyard, which included a backyard shed, and I also helped brainstorm some ideas with Charlie as far as advertising. And Charlie put Sam to work cleaning the bedrooms and bathrooms, and this was something Sam said scared the crap out of him as one of the rooms he went into had snakes slithering out of every corner of the wall. Sam said as he saw the snakes slithering towards him, he ran out of the room and into the hallway, where he bumped into Jack. Sam said when he told Jack what he saw in the room, Jack just laughed and said, oh, Well, so you found the snake room, huh? Sam told Jack that he needed an exterminator to get on that problem really quickly. Jack just laughed and said Trent was on it before walking away. Sam even told me that Katrina told him that while she was working with Trent in the kitchen that day, Trent had said something that made her very creeped out. Katrina stated that Trent said that judging from her ethnicity, he had a bit that she had a lot of melanin within her. Yeah, when Sam told me that, I thought that was beyond strange. But that wasn't all. Katrina told Sam that Trent then went on to say how melanin went for 400 bucks on the black market and that people would kill. And Katrina told Sam that Trent put emphasis on the word kill just to get that shit. Now Sam said Katrina told him that. And that scared the crap out of her and at that moment she didn't know what to say. So she just nodded and said uh huh and rushed the hell out of the kitchen. And yeah, as I heard Sam tell me all of that, it scared the hell out of me too. It was a conversation like that with someone. Later that evening, after we had finished doing day one of cleanup work and getting the B&B ready for opening, we all sat around the dinner table for dinner. It was a meal that Katrina had cooked up earlier for everyone during her cooking test. It was during dinner that Rob told us that right before dinner, he had been chased through the wooded nature trail by dogs that belonged to Jack. This too probably should have been a red flag in my mind, but again it wasn't. This did scare the hell out of me, particularly because I have a morbid fear of dogs. Ever since I was 10, I've been scared of dogs, specifically the larger ones. Jack explained away the incident as just being one that happened by accident and that the dogs were harmless, but that did nothing to quell Rob's anger over the incident. As everyone talked about how their first day went, Jack began to tell us what was in store for tomorrow. A spirit cooking ritual. What? I asked him, what the hell was a spirit cooking ritual? Sam and I both had asked him, but Charlie just gave us the weirdest answer of how it was hard to explain but that we would just have to wait until tomorrow to see what it was for ourselves. I would have been fine with that answer, and I think Sam would have too, had we not seen Charlie smile and wink at us immediately after stating his answer. Again, this should have been another red flag, but it wasn't. So after dinner, we settled in for the night. We go to sleep in the only four rooms that looked decent and had furniture in them. And then at one in the morning, Trent yells for us to come downstairs, because Jack needed all of us out in the wooded nature trail with him ASAP. I thought, what? At one in the morning? I mean, what for? Trent said it was because inspection people were coming first thing in the morning, so we needed to help Jack pretty up the wooded nature trail tonight. Well, he... Trent, 
and Marissa and Charlie cleaned up the inside and the rest of the outside areas of the B&B. And I thought, okay, but this couldn't be done at 4 or 5, maybe even 6 in the morning. This had to be done at 1 in the morning. I don't know why this wasn't sending off red flags in my head at the time. It should have, but I guess I was being just so damn naive and gullible to believe shit that now looking back made no sense at all. So with flashlights in hand, Sam, Katrina, Rob and I walked towards the wooded nature trail. The first thing we noticed that our cars were gone from the garage area. And that was strange because that's where we parked our cars when we came to the B&B on the first day. Who moved our cars? And Katrina stated how she thought maybe the cars were moved out so that they could clean the garage area. Because the garage area did have a funky type of smell to it. Rob, Sam, and I went along with that idea. Yeah, maybe that's why our cars were moved. We were stupid. Anyway, after walking the better part of five minutes on the wooded nature trail, we heard footsteps a few feet away from us. As we turned to our left, we saw several feet away, Charlie in full army fatigues. From the black and green war paint on his face, to the army hat on his head, down to his big black combat boots. In Charlie's left hand was a long butcher knife. And he was standing there, just staring at us like a homicidal lunatic. At that moment, my blood ran cold. I couldn't understand it. Sam couldn't understand it. Katrina couldn't understand it. And neither could Rob. Why the hell was he standing there with the knife in his hand? Basically looking at us like that. Now, before we even had time to think any further... We heard growling from behind us. As we all turned around, we saw three big black Rottweiler dogs standing a few feet from us, with long, sharp, white teeth that were showing slight drool dripping from their mouths. That was the time we began to panic. As the dogs instantly began charging towards us, Rob shouted for us to run. And run, we certainly fucking did. And as we ran, I looked back at the dogs and saw that another dog had joined the three that were already chasing us. This made me pick up the pace in my running, and I told the others to do the same. However, it seemed the more we ran, the further away the B&B seemed to be. As Rob, Sam, and I ran back up the porch of the B&B, we didn't even realize that Katrina wasn't with us. We really had no time to think of anything, because as we rushed through the doorway of the house, one of the dogs jumped onto the porch, grabbing a hold of Rob's legs and yanked him down onto the ground. As Rob yelled for us to help him, Sam and I grabbed a hold of Rob's arms and tried our best to pull him towards us, towards the inside of the house, away from the dog that was biting down on his leg. There was blood spurting out of Rob's leg, and as I looked up, I saw the other three dogs speedily making their way towards the porch. I knew we were running out of time. We had to get Rob free from the dog's clenches quick. Sam and I pulled even harder to try to get Rob's legs free, and as the other three dogs rushed onto the porch, that was when Sam and I were finally able to pull Rob free from the dog that was biting his leg. And just as all four dogs reached the door, Sam and I slammed the door shut just in time. However, the horror wasn't over yet. As Sam, Rob, and I remained in the hallway of the B&B. Before we could even collect ourselves mentally, a loud shotgun blast was heard from outside, making us all jump. The blast made a huge hole through the front door. My only thought... What the hell was going on? At that moment, we heard Jack's voice from outside. We well, all welcome to the beginning of the spirit cooking ritual, Jack yelled. What? I thought. What was he talking about? I mean, what in the fuck was going on here? Was this some sort of game or something? I thought. And then Rob figured it out. They're trying to kill us. 
Rob blurted out, and at that moment, in a brief split of a minute, it all made sense. The weird questions Jack asked us during the interview, the bloody kill room Jack had shown us, the wooded nature trail tour Jack gave Sam and I during the interview, where he killed that squirrel right in front of us, the mention of the spirit cooking ritual during dinner that previous evening. Yeah, it was finally making perfect sense. We'd all been lured into a scam. A deadly scam where we were going to be the victims of a frightening murder that would be carried out by a group of fucking crazies. So I began to panic. But I didn't have much time to panic as Rob, Sam, and I heard Trent's voice behind us in the hallway. And as Rob, Sam, and I turned around, we saw Trent a few feet away from us with a shotgun aimed directly at Rob's head. And before any of us could say a word, Trent fired that gun, blowing half of Rob's head off and sending blood splashing all over Sam and I. And so, there we were, standing there in shock as Rob's dead body dropped to the floor. Trent laughed like a homicidal maniac. And the fact that Trent then said, Oh shit. I felt good. God damn, I love killing. It turned my blood cold. Well, I was beyond terrified at that moment. These people were mental cases. And I kept thinking, maybe this is a dream. Maybe this wasn't supposed to happen. But no, this was happening and this was very real. And as I stood there, shocked and stunned by my fear... Sam grabbed my arm and pulled me up the stairs of the B&B. Why didn't he run with me out of the B&B? I didn't understand at the time. I do now. Where would we have run once we were out of the B&B? Our cars were taken out of the garage to God knows where, and the B&B was in the middle of nowhere. And from what we knew, Jack was still outside with the dogs. So where were we going to run outside? So as Sam ran with me up the stairs, it was dark. We couldn't see which rooms were which. Sam tried flipping on the hallway light as we got up on the upper floor, but the lights weren't turning on. And so Sam just ran with me into the first door we saw. And that room happened to be the kill room. As we ran in, Sam closed the door behind us. We saw the room was lit by red light bulbs that were nailed to the ceiling. Sam ran over to the windows and began to pull them open, but it was no use. Either Jack, Marissa, Trent, or Charlie had nailed the windows shut from the outside. That didn't stop Sam from trying to pry open the windows, though. Meanwhile, my mind was stuck on what I had just seen downstairs. A murder, a horrifying murder, right in front of my very eyes. The blood of someone else splashed all over me all over my skin. As I looked up, I then saw something that heightened my fear. A few feet away was a gurney, and on that gurney was a dead body. I couldn't tell if it was male or female or not, but the eyes on the body had been removed. The chest on the body had been slit wide open. All the organs inside the body had been removed, and blood was smeared all over the outside. It was horrifying, and I kept thinking, is this what they're going to do to us? As I called Sam over for him to see what I was seeing, we both stared, shocked and horrified. But then, at that moment, we heard Trent's voice yelling, Little pigs, little pigs, let me in. This guy was insane. Within a second thought, Sam grabbed my arm and pulled me over to a closet to hide. With Sam slamming the door to the closet behind us, it wasn't a minute after we were in the closet that we saw Charlie dragging a kicking and fighting Katrina into the room with Jack following behind. Now I wanted to rush out of that closet to help Katrina, but Sam whispered no. In fact, Sam covered my mouth to keep me from even making one damn sound. 
And in that closet, I saw the second most frightening sight of my entire life. I saw Charlie stabbing Katrina over and over as Katrina fought and screamed for her life. And as blood splashed everywhere, he just kept stabbing her. All I could do in that closet while watching all of this was cry. Cry and wish in my mind that I could help her. That Sam and I could both help her. But we knew we couldn't. If we had rushed out of that closet to help Katrina, Charlie and Jack both would have killed us too. So all I could do was watch another life get taken right in front of my damn eyes. After what had to be about the 10th or maybe even the 11th stab, we saw Charlie stop stabbing her. And then he looked at Jack and smiled. We heard Charlie say how he was going to drop off the two, now realizing he meant Rob and Katrina, and would come back to the B&B to pick us up. We gotta get out of here, I thought. As we saw Charlie drag Katrina out of the room with Jack following behind, I finally broke into uncontrollable sobs. I couldn't believe what had transpired in just a matter of minutes. The horror I had seen. Sam got up from the floor and tried to pull me up. I was too emotional to even stand. I was too traumatized at that point. Hell, before a moment could even go past from Katrina's murder, all of a sudden, I found myself being yanked through the wall in the closet and into another room. A Sam yelled out for me and tried to grab me, but couldn't in time. As I yelled and fought to keep myself from being dragged, before I knew it, I was being tossed across the floor of another room, the snake room, which, like the kill room, was also lit by red light bulbs that were nailed to the ceiling. I knew I was in the snake room because within seconds, as I got to my feet, I saw snakes slithering out from every corner of the wall, and the one thing I'm scared of, more than dogs, snakes. I was terrified. I rushed to where I thought the door of the room would be, but I couldn't find it. It was as if the door of the room didn't exist. And so I began yelling and pounding on the door for help. For Sam, but it didn't help. No one came for me. So I did the one thing I could think of to do. Move as far away from the snake slithering toward me as possible. That wouldn't help much, but... What else was I going to do? Now, to pure fear, I broke into sobs. Call it being a sissy or whatever for crying, but I was scared. Hell, I was scared shitless. As I was backing up, someone grabbed me from behind and yanked me out of the room. As I was kicking and fighting to get free from the person dragging me down the hallway, I looked up and saw it was Jack dragging me. Crap. I was going to die. This was it. He was going to kill me. As he dragged me down to the basement, to a door that read operating room on it, I fought even harder. I knew I had to do something, anything to prevent from going on the other side of the door. However, all my fighting was in vain. You see, Jack was much bigger and much more built than I was. I couldn't get free from him. As he opened the door and dragged me inside the room behind the door, he dragged me over to a gurney. And as Jack picked me up and threw me down on that gurney, I felt a large pain shoot throughout my back. I was sure he had in fact broke my back with the way he slammed me down on that bed. This is when my fear turned into anger, anger and determination, as I took my feet and kicked him hard in the nuts. I kicked him with such force that he fell down to the floor on his ass. At that moment, I jumped off the gurney and I ran towards the step of the basement, but not before Jack grabbed me by the back of the legs and tripped me. I fell to the floor. Jack jumped up and grabbed a hatchet sitting on the shelf next to him. As I saw that hatchet in his hand, I knew I had to either fight back or die at that moment. I had another choice. And then, at that moment, Jack swung the hatchet down. 
aiming for my legs, but I rolled away from Jack just at the right time. As I got to my feet, he grabbed me by the neck from behind and slammed me up against the wall in front of him. He held me against the wall by squeezing his hands tightly around my neck. I thought right then that, hell, this could be it. My vision started to blur. My mind at that moment went back to the very moment I called about the job, and I began mentally wishing I'd never called in the first place. I was about to give up, but then I didn't, because I knew I wasn't ready to give up at that moment. I wasn't ready to die, and so I reached my arm over as far as I could and managed to grab a pair of scissors hanging from a nail on the wall. I took the scissors and stabbed it down hard into his arm, and he yelled and let go of my neck. I dropped to the floor almost like a rag doll. Throughout all my coughing and gagging to breathe, after almost being choked out, I crawled away on the floor before managing to get to my feet and run to the other side of the room, where I grabbed the pistol sitting on the shelf. And as Jack rushed over to me, he stopped in his tracks as he saw me aiming the pistol at him. I couldn't believe it. At that moment, the very thing I was afraid of and didn't want absolutely anything to do with, I was actually holding in my hand and about to use to kill someone who was trying to kill me. I couldn't have been more terrified in that moment. So there Jack stood, a few feet from me, smiling like a loon. Well, what are you going to do to me, boy? He said to me. Shoot me? Why, you hate guns, remember? In fact, didn't you say that guns scare you? So don't be a fucking moron. Oh, I will, I replied. I should kill you after you murder Katrina and Rob. He then laughed at me and said I didn't have the balls to shoot him. And as he took steps forward towards me, my heart began to swell with fear. I didn't want to fire that gun. Because he was indeed right. Guns did scare the shit out of me. But as he rushed toward me and tackled me down to the floor, I realized I had no choice. Of course, at this moment, it was hard for me to even pull the trigger as he had his hands now wrapped around the gun, trying to pry it from my hands. As we fought and tussled on the floor for the gun, somehow, I believe now out of pure luck, I managed to pull the trigger, not once, but three times, firing it into his chest. His eyes widened and blood spilled from his mouth. He dropped down dead on top of me. I went into a brief mental breakdown. Somehow throughout the breakdown, I managed to push him off of me and get to my feet. But as I stood there, I stared down at my bloody trembling hands in stunned shock. I was seconds, just merely seconds away from mentally cracking up, because I'd never killed anyone before. However, it was hearing Sam's yelling from outside that shook me out of my moment, as I call it. As I looked around the room for what I could use to help Sam, as I certainly wasn't going to use that gun again, I grabbed the baseball bat sitting on the shelf and ran up the stairs to Sam's aid. I ran outside following Sam's yells, and I saw Trent on top of Sam a few feet away from the porch of the B&B, choking the crap out of him. Anger erupted within me, and I ran over and bashed Trent in the back of the head with the bat. I dropped the bat and dropped down beside Sam, and I helped him up on his feet after asking if he was alright. He was coughing bad, and he said he felt weak and lightheaded, and as I looked up, I counted it as a miracle that Marissa's truck was in the driveway. It hadn't been there when Sam, Rob, and I had run back into the B&B before. I helped Sam over to the truck, 
Gahim inside and cursed in anger when the keys were in the ignition. It was at this moment that Sam told me the keys were on Marissa, whom Sam had killed in the hallway of the B&B before being attacked by Trent. So I left Sam inside the truck, told him I'd be right back, and rushed back into the B&B for Marissa's keys. I didn't even realize that Trent was no longer laying on the ground in front of the B&B any longer. And as I rushed inside, from out of nowhere, Trent jumped on my back like some kind of spider monkey or something and began biting me and tearing at my skin on my neck and lower face. And it was at this moment that Trent and I became embroiled in a fight. I struggled to get him off of me, and once I did, we began exchanging blows, and our fight rolled over into the dining room, where we were knocking over tables and chairs and stuff. It was brutal, and he was strong, stronger than I had thought. As the fight continued, somehow Trent got on top of me and began choking me. And what was with this guy and him choking people, I thought. I fought as hard as I could to get his hands off my neck, but I couldn't. This kid was strong. And as I was close to blacking out, Sam rushed up from behind Trent and put Trent in a tight chokehold while pulling Trent off of me. Now Sam and Trent were engaged in a fight with each other. All I could do was gag and cough, trying to regain my composure after almost being choked out. I don't remember how long the fight between Sam and Trent lasted, but I do remember Sam eventually jumping on top of Trent with a knife in his hand. A knife that must have belonged to Trent, slashing Trent's throat, killing him. Now Sam looked at me and I looked at him. We sighed with a relief that, hey, it was over. We survived and it was over. As we both walked out of the B&B and walked to the truck, got inside and drove away from the B&B, we had no clue that it wasn't over just yet. Because hiding in the back seat of the truck, was Charlie. The Sam drove with me in the front passenger seat. Charlie popped up from the back seat and grabbed Sam from around the neck, trying to strangle him. These people they had some sort of obsession with strangling. Now Sam almost lost control of the wheel while gagging to breathe. I told Sam to keep his hands on the wheel. I then bit down hard on Charlie's arm, making blood stream out of it and making Charlie yell out in pain while letting go of Sam. I'd finally had enough of it, and at that moment, anger jumped in me as I jumped into the back seat and tackled Charlie down to the floor of it. We began fighting, punching each other, and then Charlie got on top of me, trying to do once again what they obviously loved to do strangled me. But I managed to take my right foot and press it down on the back car door handle a few feet away from me to open it. And as the door swung open, I took my right foot and kicked Charlie hard in the nuts, sending him flying off of me and out of the car. With quickness, I shot up, grabbed the truck door handle and slammed it shut. As I looked out the back rear view mirror, I saw Charlie stand to his feet on the road, shake his head and shoot his eyes over at the car we were driving away with. He had to be pretty strong to survive being kicked out of a moving truck. However, finally, I thought, finally it was over. Sam drove us straight to the police station in town and we told the two investigators everything that had happened. Told them all about Jack, Trent, Marissa and Charlie told them the addresses of the B&B, and later one of the detectives told us that he sent officers out to the address we gave him, and that there was nothing or no one there but an empty house. No bodies of Jack, Marissa, or Trent. No spirit cooking ritual. They didn't find any snakes in the snake room, no blood or gurney or anything creepy in the kill room. In fact, the detectives said that the house was an old plantation house, that had been abandoned for years. Well, I couldn't believe it. Neither could Sam. We know what we saw. We know what had happened to us there. So what the hell was happening? 
The detective told us a car would take Sam and I home from the station, because Marissa's car that we had drove to the station in was being impounded. So we went home. As we were riding home though, in the same car together, I thought back to something the detective told me in the interrogation room I was in at the station, and I told Sam about it. I told Sam how in the interrogation room, the detective mentioned about the spirit cooking ritual, and how I had never even mentioned the spirit cooking ritual to either detective. For some reason, I had forgotten all about mentioning it. I asked Sam if he had mentioned the spirit cooking ritual to either detective, and Sam swore and declared that he didn't, and didn't even think about mentioning it. So how in the hell did that detective know? Unless he and the other detective were in on it. Once I was home, I decided to google the detective's names, and I found online a picture that both the detectives had taken with the police chief and the rest of the, the policeman department staff. And on the bare arms of both detectives and the police chief was the same tattoo that Sam and I saw on Trent and Jack's arms. Only the tattoos that were on the chief of police and the two detectives' arms were smaller than the one Jack had on his arm. That means that those detectives and the chief of police were in on what happened. Probably the entire force was behind it. Days later, Sam and I received a visit from the two men who identified themselves as CIA agents. The agents told us they had gotten into contact with the police and detectives at the station, and that they knew our story, what had happened to Sam and I, and that we were to tell no one else of what happened to us, because if we did, there would be grave consequences. The alarm bells in my head finally started going off. I asked them why, and if they were connected to Jack, Charlie, Trent, and Marissa, but they wouldn't tell me nor Sam. They just said that for our safety and livelihood, to not tell anyone else what had happened to us, and that they would be watching our every move. Obviously, this scared the crap out of us. It also made us believe then that not only was the entire police department behind what happened to us, but that the government was behind what happened to us as well. And so, here I am, present day. I've changed my name. So has Sam. Sam and I, well, we moved our families out of the state we were in, and in fact, out of the US. I won't say what country we're in now, but we're in hiding for our safety. But I still don't think we're safe where we are. I mean, Sam and his family and me and my family... We've had to move six different times because each time that we settle in a place, we eventually feel like they had found us due to us getting constant threatening and harassing phone calls, having our homes broken into, and feeling like we were being watched and followed. In the country we're now in, we've been here for about three months, so we think like we may be safe, but... I don't know, we're still unsure. We're constantly looking over our shoulders. I don't think we'll ever feel completely safe. I can't really explain what happened, but I believe that job ad we responded to was to lure us into being the victims of some type of government organ harvesting theft. And to this day, I still suffer from the nightmares almost every night from what I went through. My life has never been the same, and it'll never be. Sam's turned to alcohol to cope with what happened, and that in turn affected his life so much that he and his wife divorced. I wanted to come on here though, as I said after talking with friends whom I felt I could truly trust to share what happened to me and Sam. Just to warn people, Sam and I are working with some of our friends to try to get this story out to people on a wider scale. Because of all of them, Trent, Marissa, and Jack are dead. But Charlie is still alive. He's still out there somewhere.
And who's to say Charlie won't recruit new people to do the same type of job? So I'm warning people. Be careful about what jobs you take and respond to on Craigslist. Because if this could happen to me, and to my friend Sam, and to the other employees who responded to the job, well, it can happen to you. Find out if the job you're responding to and applying is real. If it's too good to be true, it probably is. If the job is in the middle of nowhere with no cell phone service, do not take the job. Something wrong there. So, just wanted to warn people. I feel better knowing that I did, but what had happened to me will be with me for the rest of my life, haunting me. Terrifying me, but hopefully, if you followed my advice, the same terrifying event that happened to me won't happen to you.